theme this evening is how the books of the Bible were gathered together. How the books of the Bible were gathered together. Many Christians who love the Scriptures as the infallible Word of God are aware that the Bible contains 66 books but are quite unaware of how those 66 books in God's providence came to be gathered into one Bible as we have in our hands today. How did we end up with this Bible, the Word of God, with Genesis to Revelation? This subject is a useful one and has lessons for us, not just uh, for those who are interested in a bit of history, but there are practical lessons for us uh, in this subject. First of all, then, let us consider the Old Testament canon. The Old Testament canon. And first of all, under that, what we mean by the word canon. Sometimes we talk about the canon of Scripture. Many of you will have heard the phrase, perhaps you use the phrase, but you've never actually thought what the word canon means, or perhaps you have. Others maybe haven't come across the word, but the books that are included in the Bible are called canonical. And the reason is as follows. The word canon in Greek is a word uh, that is used, it's used a couple of times in scripture, though it's not actually speaking about scripture where it is used. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. That word rule or line the margins is the word canon and then again in verse 15 not boasting of things without our measure that is of other men's labours but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly the word rule again is canon to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line or rule of things made ready to our hand. That's the word canon again. It's used in Galatians 6 and verse 16. As many as walk according to this rule or canon, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. So there the word canon is used, but it's not simply referring to scripture. But the word means a rule or a standard. It's the same root as the Hebrew word kana, compare our word cain, and the primary meaning is a reed or straight rod. Then it came to be used in the sense of a ruler, a measuring ruler. Then it refers to the standard or rule produced by the ruler and then it came to be used of the rule of orthodox faith and practice and then of those books held to be divinely inspired on which all teaching regarded as orthodox must rest. In other words, the, those books which stood as the rule, the standard, the test of all doctrine as to whether it was true or false, orthodox or heretical. In other words, the scriptures. And that's why we use the word canon of the scriptures. And so the word came to be referred to the books that Christians recognize as not the word of man, but the word of God as the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Scripture then is made up of 66 canonical books, books which are accepted by Christians as the rule of faith and practice, what they are to believe and what they are to do. Now, what can we say about the formation of the Old Testament canon? Well, actually very little is known 
about how the books uh, were gathered together, how they were preserved and gathered together. We can say some things. First of all, later books, later Old Testament writers refer to earlier writers as authoritative. To give some examples, uh, 2 Kings chapter 22 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 8 And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord and Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it and then uh, in verse 13 Go ye inquire of the Lord, you see the verse 11, and it came to pass when the king heard, had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. Verse 13, Go ye inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great wrath, great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according unto all that which is written concerning us and then in verse 19 because the, where the Lord uh, commends the king Josiah because thy heart was tender and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof that they should become a desolation and a curse and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. So there the Lord owns his own word as that which he spake. But you'll see that uh, Josiah and those with him, they humbled themselves because they heard this word read to them. They acknowledged that what was written uh, long before their day was indeed the word of the Lord or in the book of Daniel and chapter 9 Daniel chapter 9 and verse 2 when in Daniel 9 verse 2 in the first year of his reign I Daniel understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. There Daniel acknowledges the words of Jeremiah the prophet as the word of the Lord. Then in verse 10, Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Ye all Israel have transgressed thy law even by departing that they might not obey thy voice Therefore the curse is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses the servant of God because we have sinned against him and he has confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil for under the whole heaven hath not been as hath been done upon Jerusalem as it is written in the law of Moses all this evil is come upon us Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. So uh, Daniel acknowledged that Jeremiah was the word of the Lord at the beginning of this prayer and here he acknowledges the law given by Moses as also the word of God. Then in Zechariah chapter 1 Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 5 and 6 Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. There the Lord through Zechariah refers back to earlier prophets as the word of the Lord. So later Old Testament writers acknowledge earlier 
books as authoritative as the word of God. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, except a, certain, a limited amount which was, also, which was written in Aramaic. Aramaic is, a, is similar to Hebrew, but not exactly the same. But most of it was written in Hebrew. And uh, Christ and the Apostles accepted the Old Testament canon. Matthew 5 and verse 18, the Lord Jesus indicates as much. Matthew 5 and verse 18, For verily I say unto you, that till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And many of you will have uh, heard me uh, explaining this before, but jot and tittle uh, are a reference to the Hebrew uh, language. The jot or, or yod is the smallest Hebrew letter. And the tittle is a little mark that distinguishes one Hebrew letter from a different Hebrew letter, rather like the crossing of the T in the English alphabet. So the Lord Jesus is saying, not one jot, not one of the smallest letters of the Hebrew alphabet, not one tittle, not one little mark distinguishing one letter from another, uh, shall pass away from the law till all be fulfilled. Therefore, the Lord Jesus there acknowledges the absolute inerrancy of Old Testament scripture. This Hebrew Old Testament was written with a pen or pointed reed. You have a reference uh, to such an implement in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 8. Jeremiah 8 verse 8. How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. And a pen uh, in those days was a pointed reed. And uh, a, there's a reference to ink in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 36 uh, verse 18 then Barak answered them, He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book, some form of ink. And they would be written on uh, 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 skins prepared for writing and rolled up into a scroll. There's a mention of this in Jeremiah 36, verse 14. Therefore all the princes sent Jehudi, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushi, unto Barak, saying, Take in thine hand the rule wherein thou hast read in the ears of the people, and come. So Barak, the son of Neriah, took the rule in his hand and came unto them. And so the Old Testament, the inerrant scriptures of the Old Testament, would have been written with a pointed reed and some form of ink, on skins prepared as writing material. And these original Hebrew scriptures are accurate to the jot and tittle. Now, even though the first copies are no longer available, multitudes of copies were made and made with uh, great care so that the word of God was preserved by means of the Old Testament Church of God. We sang of that in Psalm 147, 19 and 20, uh, that the Lord gave his word unto Jacob and his testimony in Israel, that the Lord gave his word to the Old Testament Church and it was preserved by that means. So Romans 3, 1, 2, the Apostle says, What advantage then hath the Jew, and what profit is there in circumcision? Much every way, chiefly that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And uh, the Old Testament canon, which the Jews accepted, is as it is in our Bibles. The books that we have in our Old Testament are the books that 
the Jews accepted as the word of God and the Old Testament canon as then accepted by the Jews was accepted by the Lord Jesus Luke 24 Luke 24 and verse 44 Luke 24 verse 44 and he said unto them these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me now the Lord Jesus is there taking in the whole of the Old Testament the law the first five books the prophets the prophets refer to the earlier and later prophets so sometimes they can be considered as two batches the earlier ones Joshua, Judges 1 and 2 Samuel 1 and 2 Kings the later ones uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and then the twelve minor or smaller prophets as we know them the Psalms probably refers not only to the book of Psalms but to the that batch of books known as the writings of which the Psalms was the biggest and that takes in Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah and 1 and 2 Chronicles and this is the order in which the books were laid out in the Hebrew Bible because in the Hebrew Bible all the books were the same as in ours but the order was not the same and so you had the laws, uh, the law, the prophets and the writings of which the Psalms were the biggest. So when the Lord Jesus says the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, he means in the whole of the scriptures, in all of those books, in their three compartments as accepted by the Jews as being the word of of God now then in Matthew 23 and verse 35 Matthew 23 and verse 35 the Lord says to the Jews that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed from the earth, upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias son of Barachias whom he slew between the temple and the altar now what's the significance here he says from Abel to Zacharias now Abel obviously was the first martyr but Zacharias in terms of time order was not the last but you remember we said that the Old Testament books though identical to what we have in our Bibles they normally were arranged as the law, the prophets, the writings and the last book of the writings was Second Chronicles and the last martyrdom in Second Chronicles is that of Zacharias the son of Barachias so what the Lord Jesus is saying is, what he's saying is all the martyrs slain within Israel their blood will come upon this generation and to say that he says he takes the Old Testament in the order in which it was customarily arranged and he says from the beginning to the end from Abel in Genesis to Zacharias at the end of Second Chronicles normally the last book in the Jewish arrangement of the Old Testament scriptures it's equivalent we would say from Genesis to Revelation he's saying that all the martyrs mentioned in the Old Testament scriptures the blood will come upon this generation but the point is this the Lord Jesus was acknowledging the whole Old Testament canon as accepted by the Jews which are the same books that we have in uh, the Old Testament of our Bibles so the Lord Jesus Christ accepted the Old Testament canon 
as it existed then and as it exists now in our Bibles. And the Lord Jesus and his apostles quote from most of those Old Testament books at some stage. The Apocrypha was not accepted. It was not accepted by the Jews, as the Old Testament Apocrypha that is, and so it was not part of that canon of scripture which the Jews accepted, which they regarded as scripture, which Christ calls scripture, and to which he refers when he refers to Abel, to Zacharias. The contents of the Old Testament Apocrypha were some supposed extra material of Daniel and Esther, books called Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, Esdras, Tobit, Judith, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes, Baruch, Epistle of Jeremy, Jeremy, Song of the Three Children, and 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Maccabees. They are the Old Testament Apocrypha. The Jews made some use of them, but not as Scripture. They clearly distinguished between what they regarded as Scripture, the Word of God, and these other books, some of which were of some use historically. Now, the liberals, liberal churchmen, due to a low view of the real scriptures, and Roman Catholicism, because of its pattern of adding to the scriptures, often print the Apocrypha with the Bible as being equal to it. Roman Catholics do that because they regard the Apocrypha as inspired. Liberals do it because they don't regard the scriptures as inspired. The one adds to the scriptures, the one, the other adds but takes away the authority of the scriptures. Now, the most useful of the Old Testament apocryphal books from a historical point of view did not even claim to be scripture. So, in 2 Maccabees 15 verse 38, the writer says, At this point I will bring my work to an end. If it is found well written and aptly composed, that is what I myself hoped for. If cheap and mediocre, I could only do my best. Now that's not the writing of an inspired man. It's not the writing of a man who thought he was inspired either. The writer is simply writing as a historian and he says, I've done my best, but Rome includes these as the word of God. The prophets didn't write like that. They said, thus saith the Lord. And if we accept the Christ of the New Testament, then the Old Testament must be accepted in its entirety. So, we don't know much about how the Old Testament books were gathered. Incidentally, I brought a Hebrew Old Testament if anybody wants to have a look at it, just so that you'll see the arrangement of the books, which bears out what I'm saying. But uh, the Old Testament scriptures were not disputed. They were accepted by the Jews when Christ came into the world and he endorsed the Old Testament canon. Now then, moving on to the New Testament canon. Again, we do not have the uh, actual documents, the first copies, but thousands of copies were made, and so we do have the text of the New Testament. The New Testament was written in Greek on papyrus strips, uh, papyrus grew near the Nile and you take strips of the material about six or seven inches long and, 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 and set them out and paste them together and then put other strips uh, if you put several strips pasted them together and then put other strips along the back then it became something that could be written on and uh, so it was uh, that the Greek New Testament, the New Testament written in Greek, was written on papyrus. 
Now, the apostolic church lived in a period of an unclosed canon, as did Israel. Uh, the prophets added to the law, and then the later prophets added to the earlier prophets. So, in the apostolic age, the Bible was not complete. It was still being written and being added to, until we come to the last book of the Bible, which was the last written, Revelation 22 and verse 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And uh, so with the completion of scripture, the apostolic circle passed away, never to be repeated. There are no apostles today, there are no infallibly inspired men, despite the claims of the charismatic movement, the Mormons and the papacy. The Apostle Paul claimed inspiration. The Apostle Paul claimed inspiration. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 2. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. There the apostle is claiming the authority of Christ to command. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Again, the apostle is claiming uh, absolute authority for what he says and writes as an inspired messenger of God. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 27 says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. There he says that this letter was to be read, publicly read, now, this is very significant and would have uh, been evidently significant. Here was a Jewish apostle saying that his epistle was to be publicly read. And what was publicly read in the synagogue? The scriptures, the infallible word of God. Therefore, this demand that it be read was saying this is scripture. This is on a par with Isaiah and with Daniel and with Genesis and uh, in Revelation verse 1 and verse uh, chapter 1 and verse 3 we read blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand that is a claim to divine blessing on those who embrace the contents of this book because it is the scripture. Then Colossians 4 and verse 16. Colossians 4 and verse 16. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Here he, the apostle says that this letter was to be circulated to at least one other church and vice versa. The book of Ephesians may well have been intended not only for the church in the city of Ephesus but for the surrounding district. You notice Ephesians has no personal greetings or salutations at all. The point here is that the apostle treats his epistles as scripture as authoritative to be read in public and to be heeded and there is blessedness for those who do 
and to be read not only in the initial place that to which it was sent but elsewhere and we find recognition of infallible inspiration by one apostle concerning the writings of another Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 Second Peter 3 verse 15 and 16 an account of the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction now there Peter calls Paul's letters scripture he says as they do also the other scriptures so Paul's letters he refers to as scripture and the word scripture alright it means writing but it had more than a literal significance when the Lord Jesus and the Apostles say it is written they're not just saying it's written somewhere by somebody they're saying it is written as the word of God it, 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 it stands written the tense used means not just that it was written sometime but it was written for permanent usage and effect it's a tense that means something that happened in the past but is of permanent significance and when the apostle says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that we read all scripture is given by inspiration of God he doesn't mean any writings he means those that body of, of books called the writings the scriptures 1 Timothy 5 and verse 18 1 Timothy 5 and verse 18 For the scripture saith Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn and the labourer is worthy of his reward The apostle there is quoting Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 and Luke 10 verse 7 as equally scripture so he takes something from the Old Testament and something from the Gospel of Luke and he refers to them as scripture so here you have the apostle referring to another part of the New Testament as well as the Old as scripture part of the inerrant word of God the apostles were aware of the possibility of false claims to scripture 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2 he says that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand so there were those writings they regarded as genuine the word of God but there was the possibility of the spurious now then towards the end of the first century the church had various sacred writings they had the words and works of Christ collected in the gospels they had the letters of the apostles to the churches they had the book of Acts as a bridge between the gospels and the letters and then the other apostolic writings mainly to individuals due to geography very few churches at that stage would have had all of the New Testament though all of the New Testament was known and accepted by some Christians not all the churches had all of it time was needed for copying and circulation and examination and confirmation there were vast distances involved there were no printing presses hence there was a delay in solidifying the canon there was a delay while uh, the, I don't mean a, a delay in the existence of it it was the word of God as soon as it was written 
but in the church coming to a united uh, declaration of what was the canon of the New Testament. There are early traces, though, of a New Testament canon. Some of the early church fathers, as they're known, quote from New Testament books as being of divine authority. For example, Clement of Rome in AD 95, roughly, refers to 1 Corinthians and Hebrews as the, and the words of the Lord Jesus. The so-called Epistle of Barnabas, around 100 AD, uses the phrase, it is written, and then quotes Matthew 22, verse 14. Polycarp, around 115 AD, in his uninspired letter to the Philippians, takes, uh, joins Psalm 4, verse 5, and Ephesians 4, 26, old and new, and refers to it as Scripture. Justin Martyr, around 150 AD, in his writing known as the first apology about Christian worship say, speaks of the reading of the memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets the New Testament and the Old Testament being read then the canon solidified uh, not long after that the heretic Marcion who was around 144 AD only accepted books that he regarded as free from Old Testament Judaism, such as Luke and Paul. And it is often said that the church was forced to fix the canon in order to respond to this heretic Marcion. But that's not quite right. The canon was already accepted. What the heretic Marcion spurred the church to do was to actually actually state what was already accepted in order to reject Marcion. Because the canon was already accepted. Around 140 AD, Valentius quotes extensively from the books that we have in our New Testament as the word of God. But Marcion stirred the church to spell out which books were held to be the word of God. Just as Montanus, the group known as the Montanists after his name, they claimed revelation beyond scripture. So you had Marcion the heretic denying that a lot of scripture was the word of God. You had Montanus claiming revelation outside of the scriptures. And this stirred the church to spell out what was already accepted as scripture. So around 170 AD the Moraturian canon was drawn up and uh, this gave the official view of the Western Church. The problem is that this particular list of books is mutilated at the beginning and the end. But definitely all the New Testament books are on it apart from Hebrews, James, and one John. And then there were, there were the books that lacked clear apostolic authorship written into the text. These took the longest to be gathered and accepted. Hebrews, James, 2nd and 3rd John, Jude. Uh, these, were, these books took longer to be uniformly accepted than some of the others. But by 364, Athanasius uh, refers to all the books we have in our New Testaments as the Word of God. The Synod of Hippo in 393 and the Synod of Carthage in 397 all confirm that all the books in our New Testaments were received as the Word of God. And once again, we believe that the church was the means of preserving the scriptures. That's why we reject the idea that the purest text of the New Testament lay dormant in obscurity for centuries only to be discovered in the 1800s and 
that that is the pure text. The New International Version is based on that theory that uh, for centuries the church was using a corrupt text and that the purest text was hidden away in Mount Sinai and in the Vatican and then discovered and now we should give place to these manuscripts that were discovered in the 1800s. We don't accept that at all. We regard the church as the means by which the text of scripture was preserved in the Old Testament and in the New and that in this way God by his singular care and providence has kept his word pure and entire in all ages. And that brings us thirdly, very briefly, the authority of the church and the authority of scripture. The authority of the church and the authority of scripture. Since God has used his church to preserve his word, does that mean that the church gives scripture its authority? Now this is an important question. Did the scriptures only become authoritative when the church got its act together and said these are the books that are to be treated as divinely inspired? Or does scripture have authority within itself? And the church's role is simply to recognize it and uphold the scriptures. Well, the second is true, of course. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. It doesn't give authority to the truth. It's like the pillar of a building or the foundation holding up the truth before men. But the truth has its authority from God himself. So that the church is like is like the post in a village in olden days when the king sent his messenger with, and the message of the king was nailed up on the post in the village. Well, the church is like the post. It doesn't give authority to the message, but it is the means of making the message visible and known to the people. The church is not the umbrella final authority as Rome teaches. In Roman Catholicism, the final authority is the church. And under the umbrella of the church's final authority, the church gives authority to scripture as well as being the infallible interpreter of scripture. That's the wrong way round altogether. Rather, the scriptures are the word of God and the church is to submit to them. That's one of the basic differences at the very starting point between Roman Catholicism and genuine Protestantism. In Roman Catholicism, the church is the ultimate authority. The scriptures derive their authority from the sanction of the church. Whereas in true Protestantism, the scriptures are the word of God. The church is to submit to the scriptures in its government, its doctrine, its practice, its worship, its discipline, they submit to the scriptures. Like King Josiah and Hilkiah the high priest and Shaphan the scribe, when they discovered the book of the law that we read of in 2 Kings 22, they submitted to it. Josiah rent his clothes because it was the word of God. He didn't ask these men to make it the word of God or to give it authority. It had its own authority because it is from God. 
You see, if we don't say that, then our main priority will not be listening to scripture, but finding the true church to trust in as infallible, and perhaps after that, that church will tell us where the word of God is. And of course that is the Roman Catholic position. But the scriptures tell us to treat the scriptures as the final authority. Isaiah 8.20 To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Scripture send us, sends us to Scripture as the last word. John chapter 5 and verse 39. John 5 and verse 39. Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Christ says, search the scriptures. Don't look to the church as infallible, search the scriptures. Verse 46, for had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? They were to believe the scriptures. In Acts 17.11, the Bereans are commended. They were more noble than they of Thessalonica, for they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Abraham tells the rich man concerning his brothers still in this world, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. It's not that the church has the final authority. Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. So scripture ascribes final authority to scripture. Scripture is the foundation of the church as far as revelation is concerned. The church is said to be built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2 verse 20. It's not the other way around. Scripture does not rest upon the church for its authority. The church rests upon scripture, is built upon the truth of scripture. Infallibility cannot depend on the fallibility, on fallibility for its authority. Inspired scripture has its own authority. Rome bids men to trust in the church, to join the church first, and then submit to whatever the church says is scripture. Whereas true Christianity calls men to heed the scriptures personally, to read the scriptures, to heed the scriptures, to search the scriptures, to trust in the Saviour made known in the scriptures. And for a definition of the authority of the scriptures, can I commend to you the Westminster Confession of Faith. In its first chapter, paragraph 4 and 5, the authority of the Holy Scripture, for which it ought to be believed and obeyed, dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. And therefore it is to be received, because it is the word of God. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to an high and reverend esteem of the Holy Scripture, and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies, and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. Yet, notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts.
Why do men not recognize the Bible as the word of God? Because they're wicked. When do men recognize and receive the Bible as the word of God? When the Spirit of God changes their wicked hearts. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God. <coughs> we sometimes think, how are we going to convince people the Bible is the word of God? We're not. We declare the truth of the word of God and we depend upon the Spirit of God who gave the Scriptures to work in the hearts of men and women to convince them of the truth of the Word of God. But how privileged we are to have the whole Bible. How privileged we are. People very foolishly say, don't they, oh, I'd like to have lived in biblical times. I'd like to have lived in New Testament. We've got a whole Bible. We've got the whole Word of God written. Instead of saying, oh, wouldn't it have been nice to have lived then, be thankful we live now when we have the whole of the Bible. All the words breathed out by God. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen.